Oh, you'll notice it's stuck in the wall, and it will bring a burden down right away. The bottom line to everything uh, we do at Mission <laughs> is bringing people to Jesus Christ, isn't it? That's our goal. That's the reason we're there. And uh, I love that verse in Acts 1.8. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Be my witnesses, and Jesus mentioned four places. Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and you know that old King James Version? I love that. Utter most. Friends, that means no one escapes the gospel. That means the far corners of the earth. That means the hidden people back on those many 2,000 rivers that feed the gates, the Wall River, the Amazon. My wife and I have had the privilege of working with the teams of building churches on 24 different rivers of the Amazon because people like you came and joined with us. 200 working witness teams changed our world forever. And uh, what, a, what a joy. That morning, she slipped out of her hut. It was a beautiful, cloudless, blue sky day. And she was going to harvest the very first crop of a brand new garden that she and her husband had planted about a year previous. She ducked back in the house. Her children were eating off of banana leaves on the floor. They had pieces of yucca there. They were washing that down with warm banana drink. And she said to the children, you must hurry because school will be starting very quickly. You see, they lived in the village of Lista, you know, where Lista was located. It's just down from Mui and up from Chingamai. You have no idea where it's located. It's in the uttermost branch. <laughs> and their children attended that little bilingual school where the teacher was an Aburone Indian himself who spoke Spanish and taught in both Spanish and the dialect. And so they gathered up their few little notebooks and a pen that they had, and she saw them barefoot disappear around the curve of the trail, knowing they would not be home until about 1 o'clock that afternoon. Now her husband, Ernesto, he had gone fishing that morning with some of his friends, and he would not be back until late afternoon. So she had the entire morning to herself. She was so excited. It was quiet in the hut. She went to where she put almost three logs in the middle of the floor. She pulled the logs back so the sparks would not catch the thatch leaf roof on fire in her absence and burn the house down. So she went now and took from the wall her large woven basket, just like this, with a big vine strap over it. The vine strap was placed over her forehead, the basket on Rosie on her back. She then took from the wall her three-foot machete knife. She checked the blade. It was a little dull, but she would fix that on the way to the garden. She put the basket in her ba uh, machete in her basket, and now she maneuvered over to where the newest addition of the family was located. There were two poles jabbed in the soft, damp floor right next to her bed, and there that little hammock housed the tiny little baby that she had given birth to some time back. She picked that child up and mothered him for a long moment, placed him in the front of her dress, and he began to nurse it and reduce it for quite a while. Now with the basket, baby in place, she made her way out into that hot, tropical day. She could feel the sun, his fury, beating down on her back. And you never know what's going to happen in the Amazon. So one Sunday, I was on my way to church, and I was going to preach one of those favorite messages, you know. I was going to preach about the lost sheep, the 99. And I was on my way to church that morning, and I climbed the hill. I walked into the door of the church, and it struck me. These people never seen a sheep. They have no idea what a lamb is. Those animals are not able to pray for it. So they wrecked my message wherever I could preach it. But then I remembered another night. My wife and I were sitting in our home that overlooks the two rivers, and we heard from somewhere, off in the distance, this very eerie sound. What is that? Oh my word, where's that coming from? What is that noise? I turned to my wife. She said, I don't know. We both made our way over the screen window. We looked out in that inky blackness. We could see nothing. But that sound, first it came from this direction. Then we heard 
that sound way over here in this part of the jungle. And then we hear it way back here. And what in the world is that? We couldn't come to terms with it. Well, we went to bed that night, but we didn't sleep. We kept hearing that sound over and over in our mind. Next morning, I woke up and I went to my helper and I said, did you hear that sound last night? He said, well, yes. I asked him, what in the world was it? He scared us silly. He said, that was a lady out looking for her lost dog. I said, what? He said, you, you've seen in church on Sunday morning, the women had the puffs in the front of their dress. Yeah, I didn't even see a pig there. He said, you know, that's the woman's job to take care of that pup until he's old enough to train to hunt, then the man takes over. But until then, it's her responsibility. He said they probably came home from their gardens yesterday, saw the pup had escaped out into the jungle, got lost, couldn't find his way home, and he took one look at her and she knew she had better get the trail. So she lit her little whip lamp, risked her life at night following those trails, calling for that lost dog. He said, the calling stopped, didn't it? I said, no, we didn't hear anymore. What happened? He said, well, she found the dog. Now, she didn't treat that dog like Jesus did the lamb. She scolded that dog, threatened him with that answer to his wife. He said, you ever do this again, I'll break every bone in your body. She fussed at that dog, picked him up, carried him back to the village, said, you do this again, I'll take you with an answer of your life. She made her way back to the village, came to her pet. When her husband saw the, the pup had returned, saved and saw, everybody rejoiced. The lost dog had come home. And we had our story. It's not the lost sheep, friends, it's the lost dog. With her baby, her basket, her machete, she now made her way across that little clearing and dropped down the hillside to that stream that flowed nearby. From that stream, they took water for their domestic use, and every afternoon they bathed in that stream. And she stood about ankle deep. She felt the cool, refreshing water flow over her bare feet. Little pebbles blazed and danced across her toes. She just rejoiced in this free moment of time. The kids were gone, the husband was gone. Just heard the baby on the way to the garden. Mm -hmm. And she looked skyward and saw the heavy canopy entangled together. Mm -hmm. She could see just little smattering rays of sunlight breaking through little tiny patches and pressing the earth around her. Mm -hmm. She took her shade from the basket, sharpened on a nearby rock, checked that blade perfect back into the basket and went. And now she crossed that stream, climbed that hill, followed the trail now that would lead her some distance away to her garden. She was perspiring because underneath the canopy it's so oppressive the air. There's no movement of air. It's still and the humidity is high. And the sun was beating down on the canopy. And she made her way quickly over those roots and dodging certain obstacles in the trail. And finally around the last bend she could see on the dotted hillside those sun-ripened bananas ready for the picking. And she knew this was going to be a good harvest today. So she walked into that garden area. She could see the beautiful yucca plants about 10 foot tall. There were green leaves glistening in the tropical sun. And then she spotted that tree that overhung the garden. Great spot. She made her way to that tree, and there were two little saplings growing about 10 feet straight up, about 3 feet apart. So she took the hammock, tied it between those two trees, took the now old nurse baby out, placed him in the hammock, gave it a nudge, and he was soon fast asleep. And now to begin harvesting the yucca. Quantos de ustedes han cosechado yucca? Ya saben cómo hacerlo, ¿no? Con con su machete. You have to dig around the root of that stem with your machete. And then you have to pull on that stem with all of your might and those long brown tuberous roots break loose in their underground chamber. And they were large tubers. Oh, she was so excited. She shook the dirt from them, cut them off of the stem, placed them under her large basket, and she worked feverishly for about a half an hour. She was perspiring profusely, but she was so excited. This garden is producing a wonderful crop. And now the basket was full of yucca. And 
and she was just about ready to go home when she spotted that lovely soccer ball sized orange ripe papaya. Her kids would love that succulent fruit when they came home from school that afternoon. So she saw a little sapling about three inches in diameter, growing straight up, straight as a die. She cut that tree off, lopped off all the branches, blended one end of that pole, and now made her way to that papaya plant. She reached high over him with her pole, nudged that ripe fruit, dropped the pole, and caught that papaya in her waiting hands. She turned it over while the birds hadn't even gotten to it yet. It was unspotted. She put that on top of the yucca, covered that with a fresh green banana leaf, and now it must be about noontime. She was so excited. I'll go home, fix the lunch for the children. My husband will be back that afternoon. And she went over to where the little baby was sound asleep. She looked for a long moment into his face and was ready to retrieve him from his resting place when from the corner of her eye, she noticed some fresh wild animal tracks. She took a careful step backward because those could be the tracks of a jaguar, of which she did not want to meet with just a machete. But as she looked at those tracks, she determined they were the tracks of an armadillo. And she could tell they were fresh. That armadillo was close by, and he would be in her pot before the day was up. So she checked on the baby, sound asleep, perfect timing. So she took the pole that she knocked the papaya down with, and now she cut a stout point and went into that pole. Jabbed her machete right next to the basket, and set foot falling the footprints in the track of that armadillo. Some distance away, around a couple of bends, and there she came to that steep hillside, and there was that hole dug deep into the ground, and the armadillo was holed up. She knew how to get an armadillo out of his hole. <laughs> so she takes this long pole, begins to break the dirt down, busting that opening wider and wider. Down on all four, she pulled the dirt back. She was tired. She was covered head to foot with the dirt. The sun was beating down on her with all of its fury. She was so dry, her lips were parched, but she wanted that armadillo. It was the last thing she did. Because she had five children. Five children. Oh, this is five. This is five. This means nothing but then the kids count with me, okay? I'm going to show you how to count in the algorithm and dialect. You take a double fist, you bring a finger down, and you say, monkey cheek.
stay in an armadillo hole many times, they'll live side to side the largest poisonous snake of the rainforest, called the douche master. Grows upwards of 9 to 12 feet. The armadillo and the douche master live side to side, never bother each other. But when he reached his hand in, he was nailed with that. But that's another story. She was not about to reach blindly into that hole. So she kept taking away, pulling the dirt back. She was exhausted. So she stopped for a long moment to rest under the shade of a tree. And as she did, she let her mind go back over the last few months of her life. She would never, ever forget that night, a year previous, that night. You see, they lived in the village of Kucha, which is a four-day walk across the jungle. And she remembered when they lived in Kucha, she heard everybody talking about the visit of the Nazarene district superintendent to the church in Kucha. Her husband taught school at that building before they moved to Lista. And she remembered everybody. It was buzzing around. The new district superintendent would be coming. And he was going to visit for the first time the Nazarene church in Kucha. He was on his four-day walking journey. And that day he would arrive. And she desperately wanted to go and hear this man speak. But her husband forbid it. He despised that Nazarene church. He hated that pastor. Because her husband drank nightly with his buddies. They would get drunk into the beating of the drum and the waving of the spears. Hey, hey, hey. In the wee hours of the night. He did that nightly. He drank enormous amount of liquor, homemade liquor, made from the yuca. Now they take the boiled yuca and you dip it in salt at your food. But the ladies, when they want to make beer, they take the yuca, put it in their mouth, they chew it around, roll it, mix it with their saliva, spit it into a big tin gallon clay pot, spit and chew for hours, several women fill the pot up, top with a banana leaf, let it sit to ferment for three days and nights. And our saliva is an enzyme called the tylen breaks down the starch and the alcohol through the fermentation process. Three days later, there's nothing left and they'll come close to it. <laughs> men are not ready for all nighter. And they will, they will come together, and the ladies will dip down into that pre-digested, the stop their drink, there are holes in this thing, strains off the bigger chunks, and the men begin to drink full holes of that. When they do, they get excited. They put on their head feathers. They put their beetle winged earrings through their ears, the men do. In our culture, only men wear earrings, not women. And we came home. <laughs> and he wanted five wives. Two each had five children. And she thought about that night long ago. You see, that night, her husband was with the other wife. So she slipped away and came to the Nazarene church and sat in the very back row. The church was illuminated by these little wick lamps to change it in place. You can only see the shadows of people. But the church was packed to overflow, not a place for another person. Everybody wanted to hear this district superintendent because his testimony was incredible. How God saved him at the age of 18. He had never heard the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't know that the book even existed. He didn't even know there was such a thing in the church. But God revealed to him in a vision one night. And it was an incredible story. And now he arrived at that village. He was preaching that night. He held the people spellbound by his testimony. At the end of the service, he gave an invitation, and many thronged to the altar. And now among that group was Ernesto's wife. She was kneeling and praying and asking God to forgive her and to help her. And at the end of that service, she was filled with joy. The people rejoiced with her. She was so excited, she went to her home that night to tell her Nesto, and, and he belittled her, he mocked her, he made fun of her, he said, I don't want you to go back to that church anymore, you're forbidden to go there. She was devastated. But the Christian side, the church, they prayed with her, they counseled her on the side, 
the ladies, in, when they went to the gardens, they would help her learn scripture. And they continued working with her and establishing her in the faith. And they said, you must give expression. You must tell someone. And she thought, who would listen to me? I'm uneducated. I'm illiterate. I know nothing. But one day, she thought about the other wife. They hadn't gotten along too well. A lot of jealousy. A lot of animosity. Because sometimes she would give the apple to one family as opposed to the other. But she humbled herself. And she made her way when her nest was not there to the other wife's hut and testified to her about what God had done in her life. And she went back another day and another day and it wasn't long until the second wife gave her heart to the Lord and both beer pots went dry. <laughs> and now her nest would never be the same. And uh, she Grin broke through those parts of dry lips. She stood back her feet, grabbed that pole, and broke the earth down again. And now the tunnel was just right. So down on all four, she began to crawl into the dark, damp recesses of that hole. Her eyes accommodated to the dim light. Further and further, she made her way in. She could feel the coolness of that clay soil around her hot, tired body. She saw that armadillo cowering in the back. He could not escape. There's nowhere for him to go. So she reached out her hand and grabbed that armadillo by the foot and was dragging him forward when the inevitable happened. 